Uh, here we are in the master bathroom here of this small one bedroom condo and you can see we've already started to demo the shower wall and good thing we did because it's so old and enough water has soaked through over the years that it's sort of weakened the, the drywall and stuff so this is actually coming off quite easily here. Now you can see they had built in one of these little shelves here and I'll show you close up. And so we're going to take apart this shelf. I prefer to build a niche in here. So we're going to build a, a custom uh, wide niche in here. The problem is, is you're up against a concrete block wall. And so you've only got uh, maybe three quarter inch furring strips here. So what we're going to probably have to do is build this wall out with a two by four, maybe two of them stacked up to give us a deep enough four inch uh, space like, like you would normally have in a wall so that you can then recess your your soap niche there and then we're going to just completely retile this whole shower from the bottom here all the way up to the ceiling I hate it when people do this if you're planning on doing your shower don't do this this just looks stupid and cheap for God's sakes people spend the extra ten bucks and buy more tile and take it all the way up to the top of the ceiling there it would just look so much better and then if you want to get really sporty, like I do sometimes, you can do up at the top of the tile along the corner there, you can make a crown molding of like travertine or something to really, really make it look classy. So all of this wall is coming down and we're going to put up curdy boards from Schluter. Uh, I love using these boards. I've used them before. It's a really great waterproofing system. And it of course is code compliant. So we're going to finish taking this wall down and then we're going to put the uh, the Reflectix, uh, it's, a, it's a type of insulation that's got kind of like foil in, in air bubbles uh, at the same time and um, it would go right across all of these studs here <clears throat> and you have to leave a three quarter inch gap behind it between the insulation and the cement block wall. That's the requirements of the manufacturer. So this type of insulation, which is borders on useless, uh, won't be used in this case here because we have a much better solution. It's cleaner too. So here's the top of that little bench shelf there removed. And you can see as we zoom in here, that's what used to be nice shiny metal studs years ago. But you can see how much water has leaked down on top of this thing. This is why I'm not a big fan of upward facing grout lines because all of the tiles that they had on top of that, um, all the tile that was on top of that bench had all of those uh, grout lines on there and water seeps in over the years. And so this is what happens. It destroys your, your subframe there. So we're going to be doing away with that. And you can see we've already started here the box out for our wall because we're moving the wall out five inches to mate up to where the tub is. See how the, the tub's about five and a half inches away from the wall? So instead of having that structure there, we're just going to have a vertical wall that starts right there at the lip of the tub and goes straight up the wall and meets up with these guys. And the reason why you see only partial studs there is we're going to make a little box out here for our niche that we have here on the floor, which is right there. Well, here we are a little further along here and building our box out for the wall here because we wanted to make sure that this wall is now going to match up to the front edge here of the tub. So you have the lip on the tub there. So when we put our curdy backer boards on there to tile over, everything's going to be right up lined up here to the edge of the, the tub here. And I wanted to point out to you folks here. I wanted to take a few minutes here. Just point out some things because a lot of people think, oh, you can just take some wood, throw some wood together here and and uh, make a wall. But, you know, there's certain building codes that you really want to make sure you're adhering to. And so let me point out to you here. This is cement block wall here. And you might find this a lot down in your basement. But here in Florida, a lot of our houses were are built like this. So this is the exterior wall of the bathroom here. 
And building codes down here, anytime you have any type of wood up against cement block, it must be pressure treated wood. And you're probably wondering, well, what is pressure treated? Well, if you've never um, heard of pressure treated wood before, they sell it at Home Depot and Lowe's and all the other stores. And you can usually tell by looking at it, it's got a little bit of a greenish tint to it, but it may not always have that kind of tint on it. Uh, pressure treated wood is also, you can tell that the edges are sometimes sharper, whereas a regular stud, they may have sort of rounded edges a little bit. Uh, but pressure treated wood is made under high heat and pressure and with chemicals like arsenic. I don't know if they still use arsenic, but certainly it has a lot of chemicals in it that, that prevent insects and termites from eating the wood. Plus, it's weatherproof, so to speak. It, uh, it doesn't allow the water to just soak in like regular wood uh, would happen. So with pressure treated wood, you have to have that up against cement block because this is porous and it could seep in moisture from the outside. And likewise, you'd probably want it in a wet area like this anyway, because if water ever made it back through the wood, to the wood, it won't rot on you. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen the bottom sill of a stud wall, you know, if you were to pop open the drywall here, like we did on another project a few months ago, the whole bottom sill was rotted out and it probably would not have been had it been pressure treated. So. That's why it's always a good idea to use the pressure treated wood. It's all I ever use here. And if you didn't use pressure treated wood, um, it's required by code to have it as your bottom plate at the bottom of the, the stud wall too. And if you didn't use pressure treated wood there, then you should definitely at least have a vapor barrier under it. So here's our, our studs here um, for the build out. What we've done here is I sort of pre-built a few of these guys, see? So I took my 2x6 and fastened it to a 2x4 with my nail gun, and I shot through this way, poof, poof, like that, all the way down the line. So now it's pretty, pretty solid. And then I just, as I get them built, attach them right to the wall here. And these were done using blue Tapcon anchors. So you can see the, the little blue screw head there. The way you do this is you drill the holes through the wood and through through the cement block using a hammer drill with a masonry bit. You can't just use a regular drill bit. You'll be drilling till the cows come home and you'll never get through this stuff. But a hammer drill, especially my DeWalt, my new one is just awesome, with a concrete bit will just boof, it, it takes only like three or four seconds and it just goes right through. And then once you've done that, you then put the use your um, your regular electric screwdriver and you put these blue tap cons in and those are special anchors that are made for screwing into cement and uh, you can use those you can use sleeve anchors these are pretty much the easiest for this type of application and you can see when you're done it's pretty rock solid and then I add these blocks here so I shoot nail here and nails on the other side there and it's rock solid this thing doesn't bend move or anything it's just completely unmovable and you can see I've put blocking there too as well on that one. And I wanted to also point out to you this silver stuff you might be looking at here and you're going, what is that stuff? Well, usually with cement block walls, you usually only have furring strips, thin furring strips. And they're about an inch, or, uh, inch and a half or so wide and they go up the wall like a stud. And well, that's what, in a sense, that's what my 2x4s here are. They're furring strips, but I made them 2x4s instead of 1x2s, which is what you normally see them do. And so, essentially, you only end up on a normal wall with about a 1-inch space. Here's your furring strip. See that? There's only a 1-inch gap from your wall to the exterior wall. So, forget about getting any kind of useful insulation in there. This right here is about R4 max this reflectix here and you'll see most guys will put like this foil these sheets of this foil type stuff that they staple across there and um, this is another method here um, this one here if you buy the rolls the manufacturer just tells you to staple it across the studs and then we can put the the wall boards over it and according to this manufacturer you have to have a gap on one side of this stuff so in this case you can only have the gap in here so there's about an inch or so gap, and uh, that air gap is what helps in combination with this to give you an R4 value. 
and you can see we've already started to install uh, some of the curdy boards here on, on this end here and the important thing to remember about these curdy boards is see how they give you these graph lines on here it is so important that when you mount this board use these lines to help level so you put your spirit level right on the line and make sure it's completely level and then you can start to screw in the board here that way once it's screwed in and I know that these lines are perfectly horizontal and that these lines here are absolutely perfectly vertical and I'm, I made sure that 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 spirit level that bubble was right directly in the middle between the two lines so this is will be a great guide to help you as you're tiling uh, to give you some sight lines so that's what we have so far and now we're going to um, in this cavity because I have such a large cavity when I go to put this insulation in here now I'm going to use their the manufacturers preferred method which is I'll staple it from here all the way across here at about half the depth which will give me you know two and three quarter inches on one side and two and three quarter inches gap on the other side which gives you um, the maximum amount of R value that you can get out of this type of insulation so these are the things you need to be thinking about when you're doing this you want to make sure look if you've had problems with heat in your in your shower here like if it's not co cool enough in the winter or I'm sorry if it's not cool enough in the summertime and if you can't get heat enough in the winter you might want to look at do I have insulation in these walls because this is the time to do it right when you have them open is the time to correct everything or to boost everything to make things better this is the time to do all of that because once you put the walls up and tile it that's it it's never going to happen again okay so now before we put the curdy panel on you can see we finally got more of the reflectix insulation in place here and you can see we also added some more blocking because I like to have more places to screw the panel into so you can see we added these blocks here as well so here we're just doing a little dry fitting and you can see why we like to add this blocking whenever I know I'm gonna have two sheets joined together it's always a good idea to have a, a block there that you can screw them both into All right, so now that we're starting to put some of the Schluter panel boards up here, and this is true of just any type of cementitious board or any other panel that you're going to put up here. And the saying goes, you know, with carpentry, when you hear the guys talking about building stud walls and stuff, you'll always hear them talking about, um, you know, build a true level and plumb. Those are the three keywords that they use. And it's the same is true here. So I like to use my carpenter square here as I'm putting the panels up, and I want to make sure that I get a absolutely perfect 90 degree corner here so here we're going to put this down here <clears throat> and you can see right in this corner here I'm like absolutely perfect it's just and if you look in the corner here you should look along here and you you shouldn't see you know any gaps you shouldn't see big gaps where light seeping through but I'm going to come up here a little more <clears throat> right so right here you can see a little bit see about an eighth of an inch and here you can see a little bit too, that's an eighth of an inch. Well, you can't have that because you're going to run into problems with your tiling. So what you have to do is you've got to make this what we call true level plumb. You have to find a way to let a little bit of this board come back out to meet this square so that we'll have perfect 90 degree walls here. Now you can do it with the, the wood shims here or um, you can do plastic shims. Um, but as you as you look here, you can see that that it might look pretty straight to your eye. But let's put the spirit level up here, and you can see if you look at the bottom panel here, and you focus right there, and you look at you, you go, it's pretty much level there. That looks good. But if you notice, if you start to slide upwards, look right along in here, you might see a little bit of a gap starting to form because you know you've got waviness, you've got unevenness. The studs that these panels are attached to have crowns on them. They, they curve. They curve in and out and up and down. That's why you never get perfect walls. And on top of that, the cement block that these studs are attached to, the further you go up towards the ceiling here, it really curves back to the point that it can be off almost a half an inch. And we see this quite a bit with, uh, with houses. But here you can see now our bubble is no longer in the center here. So what does that mean? Well, how are we going to correct that? That means the level has to come back on the bottom of it about this far which is about almost three-eighths if you look at the bottom of the level 
in order to maintain that. So what do we do? Well, we can stick shims in here to pull the panel back out a little bit. What I'm going to do is I want to mix some um, thin set mortar and I'm going to mix it very, very dry. And we're just going to level it up and make a shim here. We're going to pile some of it onto all of these studs. So we'll have a dynamic level leveling type system that we can just kind of mush it down a little bit and adjust it as we need to. And then we won't set our screws in until it's completely dry. So that is how we're going to level this. So you can see here, by, once we pull the bottom board out a little bit, uh, this board will then, in order to make it all straight and everything, we'll have to come out just a frog here. So we'll, we'll put some on here. So you can see the difference here in these studs, because how far back the brick wall was like leaning backward as, it, as you go up. So that's what we have to mitigate. And then this little section here, See, also, when you're checking your plumb and level of these boards, once they're attached, and nothing means anything till they're all screwed in, by the way. So that's why you're going to put them in, you're going to screw everything in a little bit, and keep playing with them until you get the level right. But, you know, you want to put your level this way, this way, I, you know, go down here too. I want to make sure that this section here is directly over this section. But you can see there's a gap right there too. See, that's about a, almost a quarter of an inch. So this panel is going to have to come out. We're going to undo this screw here and stick some mortar behind it there uh, to act as a shim and we won't screw it in all the way until we get everything perfectly level here and it's all dried and set behind there. Now I should point out to you that um, the Tile Council of North America in the handbook they really don't want you to use mortar as a shim but I believe that's more on the floor than it is on the wall. Here you're just using it to, to give a little backing on, on here. You're not using it as really that much as a, as a load. So I think we can get away with it here. And if you're worried about that, you can always use wood or plastic shims. The reason why I'm not gonna use wood is because you'd have to stick so many in here. And if you fix one, another one falls out. There's just too many unknowns here. So we're gonna slap our concrete on every one of these uh, studs here, that way we'll just have a, a nice leveling bed that we can go in and out, up and down, whatever direction we need to, so that when we're done and we're going like this, it'll all be completely, perfectly, straight up and down, absolutely perfect, and that's the way it has to be. And when we're done, we'll be able to take our carpenter square, and we'll put it right back here in the corner, and you won't see this wiggling anymore if we do our job right, okay? Let's get to work. See what I've done here is I've started to apply some of the thin set mortar here. And some areas I laid it thick where I know we're going to need more distance and some areas I made it a little thinner. And we just kind of applied it to all of the, uh, the studs here. Now you can see I made it nice and dry so it'll stay in place. And the whole purpose of this is, is based on the same theory as when you're doing marble tile. And you build up the marble onto your your uh, bed of uh, dry packed mud there in order to make it level. So we're going to put our curdy panels right on there and then we'll be able to dynamically adjust it by the depth of the thin set until we get them nice and flat. And then once it sets we'll screw them in perfectly. Alright so right here in the middle of the board if you remembered we said we were going to have to back it out a little bit so we've shimmed it up from behind with a little bit of mortar there and um, it'll dry like a cement so it'll dry nice and firm there and it'll hold it into that position so now right now as it stands this is perfectly level and on top of that if we take our friendly square back out now and take a look you can see it's absolutely perfectly square there's no light sneaking through there's no gaps if you remember before it was wiggling by about an eighth of an inch so now i'm going to move it up here to the top here and you'll see the same thing it's it's in there just nice and perfect and all the way up against the edge of the panel whereas if you saw a few minutes ago it was wiggling and we would have had an a very crooked tile install but this right now is just absolutely perfect and <clears throat> another reason why this is important is if you just kind of look at this seam as it goes up here it's now it's nice and straight well you're gonna have tiles there and so you want to make sure you have a nice straight grout line going up the, the corner there too. Okay, so here we're getting ready to put the second panel up where the, the niche is going to be. 
And what I always like to do, if we look right down here, is I always line my boards up so they're absolutely perfectly straight right over each other so that the lines can continue. Because remember, when I set this thing originally, this, this lower board here, I made sure that this line is like perfectly level here, right? And so by doing that, I can be assured I can use these as, as great reference lines as I'm tiling. And so I want to continue that all the way up here. And then if you look in, in, in the side here, you'll, you'll see how the mortar is just kind of uh, sitting there. So we're going to be pushing in and out. And as we add our screws in, and we're not going to screw them all the way, we're just going to make them tacky enough so that we know that it's flat, perfectly flat, straight, level plumb, and all that stuff. And then when we're done with that, we can screw them in later on once, once the mortar dries. All right, so we're kind of checking our level here from like top to bottom here and making sure there's not like any gaps, you know, that way and this way. So it's starting to come along, it's getting nice and flat. And as you add more screws, you have to go back and check because if you screw in over here, it might undo something over here. Now, if you look at from here at the very bottom all the way up, you can see it's nice and vertical. You look at the bubble there. But as we get up towards the top, Look what happens, see there's that little bit of a gap right there. So we're gonna have to maybe shim up a little more even behind uh, the panel right there near the top. And this happens quite a bit with concrete block walls. They always get real inaccurate near the top and they lean back, it's common to see that. My friend's house, we had this, it was leaning back a half an inch up at the top of his brick wall. It was terrible. So all we have to do is just uh, loosen this a little more and we'll shim up behind it and stick a little more thin set back in there and let it dry at that angle. That way we'll know our board's gonna be nice and straight. And then if we bring it over here and see what we've got, it's looking pretty good here too, nice and straight. And over here, I think it was actually quite textbook perfect right there. So, let's continue on. Okay, so we're putting the little pieces here for the very top. And you can see it right here as I push the piece in, it's almost like tiling. You'll see it kind of ooze out as it finds its uh, true front level there to be straight. You want to make sure you don't feel any lippage from one panel to the next. So I'm going to put the upper right panel in here and do the same thing there. Just kind of mash it down into the thin set there. And uh, we'll leave these like this to dry and once they dry, We'll go ahead and put our, our screws through them here. I'll put them in now just to get them in and make sure that they're, they're in. Uh, in case you don't want to be combating the dry mortar later on. Uh, but we won't tighten them down. So what I'm going to do now is just get my level out here. And check from the bottom panel to the middle panel to the top panel. So you can see this one's got to come out a little bit too. So we're going to have to shim this one a little more. We may have to stick a little more mortar in there. And maybe even a, an actual shim too, uh, to get that thickness to match. And then once it does, and once it dries, we can screw through to it. So here we are. We can uh, you see just how much distance we'll need, and we might even need more than this. Yeah. So we're gonna put a little bit more thin set mortar on there, and then ooze it down. So here we are the next morning, and you can see we've come in and all the mortar is dry now. Uh, you can see right here just how much we had to stick in front of this stud here. We had to build it up about uh, almost three-eighths of an inch. And you'll see it tapers down to you know, a minuscule amount right here. But just goes to show you that last foot and a half sometimes how the whole brick wall can lean back enough as it, as it goes up. But at least now, this entire panel wall here, made out of the Schluter Curdy boards, is now com <clears throat> completely, totally vertical. So now we can go and tighten down our screws. And then I wanted to show you something over here at the windowsill. So this is just utterly ridiculous here. This is something really dumb that the builder did when they built this house. So they had built this well right here in front of the window and the way they did it was they had this they had formed a shelf you know the windowsill here made out of um, tiles and it was at a steep angle like this it was just so ridiculous and um, 
I'm sure it's functional and it drains water if any water lands on it, but you could never put a, any of your champagne, you know, champagne, your shampoo bottles on there. And the um, problem with this is, is there was nowhere for the homeowner to put their shampoo. It was like the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Uh, unbelievably steep. So what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to thin set down some of the curdy panels. We have to do one layer, then th thin set down a second layer, and then a third layer. Very similar to how they do the benches with curdy. And then we'll just shave the extra right off of here. So this will build the level up here. And then when we go to tile later on, we're going to put an entire single piece of marble on the sill. Hey, look, we're going to finish putting up all the rest of our screws on there, and we need plenty more screws here on the field of the wall here. And then after that, we're going to attach all of our little curdy squares, the little, uh, to cover up all of the screws here. And then we'll put curdy band going down the, the seams here, down the corners, to make everything waterproof before we can tile. Well, here we are the next morning after we're almost finished with all of the curdy band and the waterproofing and stuff. So you can see what we did here is over each one of the screws and washers, you have to put a little piece of curdy band and you cement it down with the mortar. And we got almost done. And then you can see wherever we had seams, we used the curdy band. There's some here. There's some here, we go all the way up the corners, all the way up to the ceiling there. And then we're going to have to get some and uh, put some here on this corner here. And uh, we've preformed them here. Uh, we'll take a little piece of it and we kind of uh, crease it to make the corner right here, these outside corners, see. So we just have that to finish today. So what you're looking at now is the, is about two hours of work between two people. Uh, it gets quite messy and there's a lot of cleanup and there's time that it takes to mix the mortar as well. And then what we're going to do here, let me show you this piece. This is the, the mixing valve uh, gasket cover here. And this will go here. And what we're going to do is to, to match it to this wider opening here, we're going to have to cut some of this around here. And it's a great idea to always leave a big space in there for in case plumbers have to get in there in the future to put in a new uh, mixing valve for you. And in fact, a lot of people make this mistake. Is uh, And I was helping a friend out a few months ago where the builder left even less space than what you see here, and we couldn't even get the cartridge out to change the cartridge for the guy. We had to chisel the tile around it which is dangerous because you can break the tile. So it's really foolish when people tile all the way up to the thing here. You gotta leave a nice big opening like that. That's why this piece is designed like that. That's how much space you're supposed to have. And then we're going to use this piece here, which goes over the pipes. You slip it over and it fits nice and uh, down there. It fits nice and snug over the pipe. And we'll cement that in place. And another one will also go up here for the shower head pipe as well and um, once we finish that we'll be ready to go ahead and start tiling okay I also wanted to show you here this was the big plastic niche that we stuck in here and the way the manufacturer wants you to do it is to once you get it screwed into place they want you to trowel out the thin set to flare it out, kind of like if, if you were drywalling to a corner on the drywall. And that, that just gets it kind of nice and even. And then we're gonna come by with our scraper and scrape off all of the little boogers and pieces that stick out and try to get rid of all of the crumbs. And also the manufacturer of this, because it's plastic, wants you to use a polymer modified thin set, which is luckily what we're going to be using here. And they're so adamant about it that they even have this warning sticker telling you about it. And they want you to wait 24 hours for it to dry when you put the tiles on here uh, before you grout uh, because they want to make sure that it can really cure because you're up against an impervious um, type material here. 
and it it won't cure enough so you really got to wait a day or so before you can add your grout to that and then lastly along these windows here before we add any more curdy band or anything we're going to get some door and window silicone caulk and we're just gonna, we're going to caulk all of these gaps here this is just extra insurance on top of our curdy waterproofing system but we're going to caulk all the way around the windows here and, and get all that done and then same at the bottom of the the tub up in this area here we're going to caulk all along all the way around the bottom of these curdy boards here well here we're looking at getting ready to start tiling and we're doing some dry fitting here real quick and you're always faced with this kind of decision on what to do with this because typically on the bathtub you have a 32 inch wall here and uh, well the tiles that we're using today are approximately 12 by 22 and these are actually about 12 and 3 quarters wide so uh, normally what you would do is you start a whole one in the corner and maybe do a whole one here and then whatever the remainder is you'll make it and go down the middle here some people will want to put it in the corner and that's fine too you can do it any way you want i just prefer a little bit more symmetrical it looks a little more logical to see the the cut piece going up the middle it looks a lot better planned i think and normally what we do too is we'll start the tiles off as you can see here i don't put my tiles all the way down to the tub i use my little spacers here as you can see what i'm doing here is i'm lifting the tiles all of them they're going to all start this lower course about an eighth of an inch off the edge and this do, does two things for you number one you don't want to have your tile ever touching the tub because there's flexion in the tub and 50 gallons of water and the weight of somebody sitting here in this tub will cause flexion and maybe the movement and maybe it bumps up against the bottom of the tile and causes it to crack or causes cracks all the way up the wall so that's why you want to elevate that off and then also um, this tub was not put on level by the way by the builder it was just a little bit off so that if you were to rest the tiles on the tub expecting to use the ledge of this tub here to be your level reference that's you're going to be sorely disappointed and so what you have to do is you have to make sure that all the tops of your tiles are just going to be in a level line with each other by using the spirit level and so by using these little wedges at the bottom it allows you to fine tune the distance i can move it up a 32nd or down a 32nd or up a 16th or down a 16th in order to match the level of the tile next to it so that's that gives you some very important uh, uh, advantage there and as you can see here we're, we're looking at planning well what are we going to do up the wall here and we're using this corner piece here this is called a the rondek this is made by Schluter this is their rondek piece and this allows you to do an outside corner so the best way to handle this is you know well we don't know how far are we going to have to have this tile come over the best way to handle it is we're going to tile this corner here this side of the wall all the way up to the ceiling first and then once that's in and this edge is very crucial that this edge all the way up be completely straight all the way up once that's done we will then come and do this side and what you do is you bury this into the thin set so i'm going to take this i'm just going to show you what it would look like once it's all done see so it has to line up to the corner there and so it's very tricky here these distances because you have to know how far out is this tile going to be with the thin set on it you know combed onto the back of it and then when you have to make it made up to this piece here too and you can see it's designed so that it'll leave you a little grout line there and then same with this other side too so once this guy is all put in place and he's the right distance away from the wall from the thickness of the of the thin set there it'll line up to this edge of it so there's a lot of little things that you got to take into account at once here there's a lot of playing around a lot of thinking you got to stay really focused when you're doing this and then on the sidewall here that's a typical 60 inch sidewall um, we won't be able to fit five of these tiles because we remember these are 12 and three quarter inch tiles and 
uh, likewise, you're going to have spacers in between. See, like these, these are the, the spacers for my tile leveling system that we're going to use here to make sure these tiles are completely in plane. So uh, you want to use those, those spacers in between, but you, you're going to probably lose almost an inch across the wall from the spacers. So you got to take that into account too. So again, what I like to do here is on these, this wall here, you do the first four tiles, and then you figure out how big to cut the one in the middle. You put it right smack dab in the middle. And All right, so I have my sheets of the river rock here laid out. There's six sheets here. And what we're going to do is we're going to cut a seven inch wide swath of this stuff and it's going to run straight up the middle of the shower where the shower head is and the plumbing and the, the tub spout and all that. And so we're going to cut a vertical straight line on this side and a vertical straight line on this side so that these will just fit right into the wall with the regular straight tile on either side of them. So what I had to do is I fitted all these together first to make sure that they're in the proper orientation so that when I cut my seven inch swaths it'll go continuously all the way up the, the wall. So you can see how they fit together here, the sheets, the way they're engineered. So they just kind of fit in pretty nice. And here we are 15 minutes later. I finally got the seven inch wide river rocks cut there. So it looks so much better when you have it trimmed to perfectly match the tiles that are gonna go on either side. And then right around there is where we're gonna put the, the shower. We'll have to remove some of the rocks there, but this looks perfect. I can't wait to get this up on the wall. All right, now back in the bathroom here. You can see I've laid out my other sheet of 14 by 22 river rock here. So I you did it with two whole sheets here, and then some of the trimmed that I took off the other sheets are up on the top, along with some single pieces that I'm trying to stitch in to make a decent sized uh, 14 by 22 rectangle. That will all go right here inside the soap dish. It's very tedious work doing that, but that's the way you have to do it with this type of stone. Well, you can see we've already gotten a head start here on some of the tiling. And it has now dried overnight, so this is the next morning after we did our first course. So pretty much we mixed about 39 pounds or so, maybe less, a little over half a, a bag. And it was enough to do these tiles here plus the tiles going up this sidewall right here. Okay, so you can see what we've done here is we got everything cemented in. We started the, the corner piece here. Of course, he's not final cemented in yet, but you can see what he'll do is he'll form a nice little grout line for this sidewall here. And then he's also forming a nice grout line for, for these tiles on this side as well. And then you can see I've got all of my tile leveling system clips in here and you can look at some of my other videos I have another video on how I tiled the, uh, a kitchen at another project with travertine tiles where I go into incredible detail on how we use these wedges and the science behind it and how it, it works on leveling but basically you can see the wedge is completely flat so when you wedge it into these loops here it actually sucks both of these tiles to be the exact same level so that you have complete level between both adjacent tiles and it's especially important on these larger tiles to do this and especially where it's really hard to work with the large tiles with a large amount of mortar on the wall and you're trying to mash it all in to get everything level um, you don't feel any lippage at all it's just perfectly smooth here and um, not only that you can see because we made good use of our little blue wedges along the bottom where we could individually adjust each tile up to get it so that each and every one of the tops of these is in perfect alignment all the way across. 
you when you're done before we put all these clips in we put our spirit level right across the top here and they were perfectly straight and flat there was no cracks underneath no light you know sneaking through underneath the, the spirit level and I'm going to show you in a minute here that you can take a spirit level put it here and all the way across over here and it should be perfectly level so here I've got my level across the two separate walls there and you can see we're pretty much dead on here okay now here you can see when you put the carpenter square up see how absolutely perfect that is absolutely textbook perfect corner here nobody can argue with how straight the corner is here and that all started with making sure that we had that that perfectly true straight level plumb uh, walls when we were uh, setting the walls up so you see why we spent all that extra time uh, a good hour or two extra just to put all of that mortar behind these panels on the studs when we were trying to level everything out because it makes your job easier here and you could still do the walls right and totally blow it on the tiles here um, because you still have to get everything proper with the the mortar and get it level and mush it into place and if you fix one dimension you break another one so you have to keep manipulating each tile for a minute or two until you get it right and then you're constantly using your little bullet level there to make sure it's straight up and down uh, that it's level left to right that it matches the height of the, the top of the tiles next to it and everything now here's where we did the, the single piece of travertine windowsill here and I like this one because it, it's already preformed with a beveled edge and you can see we put it with a, a quarter of an inch down slope a little bit more than you typically see uh, the builders do uh, but i like to make sure that any water that could land on here will drain off um, so what we did in the back here was i just laid down across three river rock stones that we had from our river rocks that you saw earlier they happen to be a quarter of an inch thick so that was perfect uh, spacer to use we just set one here one here and one here and that gives you the, the perfect slant. And you just got to make sure that you back butter the heck out of the back side of this. Because travertine has a lot of potholes on the back of it. So you want to make sure you get all of those voids filled with thin sets so that nothing can break, crack, or anything going forward. And you can hear that's nice and solid. There's no hollow spots in here like you see in other places. Uh, so uh, just very important to get a lot of mortar down under this so that when you're pushing it down you should feel the whole thing mush just because you only have one chance to get it right here okay so this guy is um, very beautiful now and now we're going to start on working on this tiling the the niche here now this requires quite a bit of consideration here because it may or may not be the best thing in the world to tile just right up to the edge here because you have to consider now the distance of the tile that's going to go here so I want to show you this is an example here of just a tile here that we might use in this position and you can't just assume that the tile is going to lean up against the, the wall there that's not correct because there's going to be the thickness of the mortar that you put there so for example if you look at this tile here see the thickness of that mortar there it's about a quarter of an inch maybe even a little more so depending on you know if there's dips in the wall you may even have to go thicker so my rule of thumb is always that I think the mortar is going to be the, about the thickness of the tile so when I trowel a half inch mortar, mortar mix on here onto the wall it's going to mash down half height to about a quarter of an inch that's a good rule of thumb so that means the tile is actually going to look something like this coming up against the wall like that. it'll be separated so in theory if I can get this little piece here you would you would make your tile come out that distance to match it see how it's actually sticking out past the surface of the wall because it has to meet the front surface of that tile so don't screw up your measurements when you're taking measurements. You've got to do all of this dry fitting to figure things out. Now in this case, since this is ceramic tile and, and you either have a white edge or this orange edge, what we're doing is we're using these little pencil pieces here to make a frame in the front of it so, so that you don't see it. The frame will cover it up. So the problem is now if you have the pencil going right here, 
you can't have the tile this long. It's got to cut down a little. So we have this other piece over here. We drop that piece out of the way. We have this uh, tile here. And you can see I brought it just to the edge there because when we put this pencil piece here in front and then allow for that distance of the mortar, let me try to line this up for you, you're going to end up something like this. And it's hard to do it with one hand, but eventually these will all fit and line up. So that, that sort of sets the distance that you're going to make that, that tile cut there. Right, so now we want to go over with you the the which order do we put these tiles in here on this niche. And believe it or not, yes, there really is a pecking order of what what order do you put them in. So I've seen people do it in several different ways, but I believe that, that my way here that I'm going to show you that I've been using for years is the better way to do it. So some people, I think, make the mistake of thinking, well, you got to put the back piece in first. And then you put this one up in front of it. But see, the problem is, is now you have an upward-facing grout line here. And I think that's a big no-no. The best way to do it is you got to look at the way the water is flowing and what it's going to do is, I think you should have the bottom piece in first, then the back piece goes on top of it, and there's no grout line. So you just do a thin bead of caulk along the bottom there. And so water is going to hit this back piece first, bounce down, and hit this, and roll off back into the tub. That's the best way to do it. So now, the, let's ask the question in the picking order here. Should I do the back first or the sides first as the next step? And, well, what if you did the side piece first and it went in like this? And then you can see you'll have a forward-facing grout line. That's another scenario that I try to avoid because water could eventually over time seep in through that grout line and then get behind the tiles. Okay, so what I want to show you here is what I'm going to do with this piece here. So here's my right side piece. And watch this. I'm going to slide it in the back there. And so see how it fits a nice, perfect, tight corner in there? And again, you just run a bead of silicon up there. So there is no forward-facing grout line at all. Any water that comes in and hits this niche is going to bounce either off the walls or off the back and then down to the bottom and, and gone. So you can see our pecking order so far then is the bottom plate first, the back plate second, and the right and left sides can go next. Now one other thing to consider is let's say you want to put, there's going to be a top piece that goes there too, which should match the bottom piece flipped around. So if you're going to put that top piece, some people like to rest it on top of the left and right tiles here. So I would have to cut this tile down a little further in order to let that upper piece with the thickness of its mortar give it all that distance to come down and rest on top of that. That's where the art really comes in on this is you know you, you make your cuts on the wet saw on the left and right pieces and I guarantee you're going to be going back to the wet saw probably two or three more times um, to get it narrowed down, but that's really the best way to do it to make sure that it stays completely tight to where you think the upper piece is going to connect. All right, so this is where the sheet of river rock is going to look like this, and this will be the back piece. Now, of course, they'll have lots of grout on here. This will all get sealed. Um, the grout will be sealed as it's mixed. So you shouldn't have too much of a problem with it. Now, as we keep working the area around the niche here, I went ahead and decided, well, we want to put the accent banner border right along here. I figured this would be a great spot to do it, right below the windowsill. It's a great breaking point. And it'll still come up sufficiently high enough on the arch niche. Although normally <clears throat> we prefer to do it about 50%, you know, about halfway to make it look symmetrical. But, you know, you can't always do that. So this is pretty close. You're at about one third. And so you can see we had to cut this piece here to accommodate. And so we're just going to have the banner come around here. It'll stop there. 
it'll pick up on the other side of the niche here and it'll go right to here and it'll stop right here at the corner piece. So I'll take a step back here a minute and just look here at all of these dry fitted pieces here up top. What I like to do whenever I you have a here you have the length of a tile about 22 inches or so whenever I break that length up like this and put a little banner in there I always like the next piece on top the aggregate of all three of these pieces here to equal the length of one whole tile like this one down here so I'd like to take that length bring it up here and make it equal to those so we'll be cutting a shorter piece to go on top here and that will bring everything back in line with what we've done over here because these were full pieces here. So everything will come back in line and it'll match this line that you see right here. And then we'll be starting again with a new row of tiles going up there. Here we are after we've pretty much completed most of the lower level, the first course, and we're continuing up this wall here by the arch niche here. And this has taken about one bag of mortar total, plus another half bag to do all of the, the curdy band that you see on there and waterproofing all of the corners and stuff like that and covering the screws. So you can see we've made good use of the tile leveling system and everything is progressing nicely. And when we put our six foot, or not six foot, we have a four foot spirit level that goes across here. You can see these are all nicely in plane. All of our tiles are standing nicely vertically. And it all shows because you'll see in the corner how perfect the, the little crack is that goes up there between the two tiles. If there was anything out of whack, you'd see it there. Okay, and then you'll notice here in the middle of the tub here, we made that piece there skinnier so that's the way I prefer to do it I make whole pieces here whole pieces here and put the skinny tile in the middle now it may not look like it's in the middle because of the window it's actually in the middle of the tub but the builder made the window offset here look how far off they did it I have no idea why they did it that way it makes more sense to me to put the window in the middle I just don't understand people's logic sometimes so it also makes it a challenge when you're trying to do tile because you have to go around it and everything the, the way they had it. So anyway, this looks pretty good so far and we're going to continue upward. And I just wanted to point something out here to you also. Um, this is why you can't rely on your tub to be level. You can't use that surface as a reference point for you. Because look at this, look what the builder did here. This tub is, as you can see, is far from level. So, I, and that's another reason why I mentioned earlier that we put spacers under our tiles to um, adjust the heights a little bit to, to give us a little margin for error. But in this case here, these have the same spacers that these do, and the top of the tile there, as you can see against the line on the curdy panel there, is lower than the one on the right. See how the one on the right goes a little bit above that line and the one on the left goes a little below that line. So when I go to set these tiles I'm gonna to have to switch to a different spacer because I'm pretty much getting out of height here. It may or may not work if I jack it up a little more but I have other spacer sizes that I use and, and because the tub is so far out of level there this tile has to come up a little bit about another eighth of an inch so these are other little considerations that you need to think about when you're doing the tiling. And thank God it went downhill because if it went uphill, wow, we'd probably be having to cut the bottom off the tile. Well, here we are. We've now gone ahead and completed all the field tiles going up the wall here that has the niche on it. And you can see we've employed a bunch of different methods here. There's a certainly a madness to my method. But yeah, sometimes you have to improvise and use different things here. So we use these big chunks of styrofoam here to hold up the 
tiles here so they wouldn't sag down. It would be your worst nightmare to put tiles up on the wall and then come in the next morning and find out that they dropped from the position that you had them in. And uh, we also had to use this board here to keep it pressure on this tile to keep him up in the, in the exact position we needed it to be in up in the, against the waller. Sometimes the tiles have a little bit of a cuppage to them and they want to pop away from the wall. They won't, they won't stay all the way in where you put them. So this helps out with that too. And so now we're going to get rid of these uh, spacers and the wedges and you just take a rubber mallet and just give it a whack like this. And got a couple down here. Give it a whack there. Now, sometimes the manufacturers will show you if you're using them on the floor to just kick them. But um, I think that's pretty stupid because you're just going to kill your toes, especially if you hit one that doesn't want to budge like if there was too much cement around it. So like here, you can see one here that you know is going to give us a little bit of a problem, most likely. So that's all you have to do. Well, now it's time to go ahead and start tiling the niche here. And you remember before when we were planning everything and doing some test dry fitting and stuff, I told you how you have to be aware of the space here uh, that's going to be present when you put the tile here. You're going to have that little bit of thickness of the mortar, which is about the thickness of the tile. So in this case, about a quarter of an inch. And so if we cut the back piece like this here, we had to leave room to be able to put our little uh, frame piece that we're going to use here. Now keep in mind the frame piece is going to be elevated up slightly so we'll have a little grout line like that see and you always want to make it so that this guy is either higher or at the same height as the pencil piece otherwise the water won't drain off right you don't want the pencil piece being above it like that so that's why everything is real critical that all, all that planning and everything and so everything's going to fit kind of like this and we will have a grout line right here um, usually I try to avoid a horizontal grout line on a on a, uh, the bottom of the niche if I can. In this case it was unavoidable because I could have just cut a whole piece of tile to come all the way to the front. The problem is this is ceramic and so it's a brown tile there on the front. So you got to do something to cover it up and that's what this, this frame all the way around the edge is going to do. It's going to cover it for us. Let me set this aside for a second, and then I'll show you what I'm going to do underneath. So in order to get this thing to be at that elevation, I used some stones here that you see left over from my little fancy border piece here. So you're going to elevate it about a quarter of an inch in the front, but then i got to have a slant to it. It's got to give it a, an incline. So we're going to use the same quarter inch tall in the back, and you can see I stuck the little blue shim on there, that little wedge. And that'll elevate it an eighth of an inch so that when you put the tile in place, you can see it is sitting in an incline there. So any water that lands on this will drain out. And it's only at a slight incline. So we're going to cement all of this down now. And then we're going to cement the back pieces on and then the side pieces. Or might do the top before the side. We'll see how it works out. All right, so now we're getting ready to mount these tiles onto the back of the niche there. The problem is, is when you're dealing with sheet mosaic tiles like this, I mean, they're very unruly. They flop all over the place. They're very difficult to work with. So what I will do sometimes is I'll take some blue tape and just start taping it across the front of the tiles like this. And you can see where I've got a completed one right here. And it does make it a little bit more stiff, not the best in the world, but usually maybe enough to get it on the wall and, and uh, work with it. However, sometimes you may find some tiles that are still loose and it could pinch the tape and then it, it's almost like it didn't do its job. So um, sometimes what I'll also do, I've done this in the past, is I'll use a sheet of this curdy waterproofing membrane here. And so I'll cut a sheet to match like the back of this 12 by 12. 
And what you do is you lay it down on a tabletop like this and you trowel out some thin set mortar right onto it. And you do just to thin them out because you don't want it oozing all the way up here through all of these cracks. And you just mount the tiles right onto this and let it sit there overnight and dry. And when it dries in the morning, it'll be nice and rock hard and stiff. And then you just cement that whole thing right onto your wall. So I may end up doing that right here where we're going to go all the way up the shower there with the river rocks. Uh, we may end up doing that for the, the smaller 7 inch wide section. Alright, so for troweling out the back of the niche here, I'm going to go with a smaller 3 16 inch trowel because I think that's all these stones really need because you don't want this bleeding through. And I've also switched here to a polymer modified thin set as the manufacturer of the plastic niche here requires. So um, I could have also used the Schluter all set that I've been using for the field tiles, but I decided to, since I had a half a bag of this lying around, I'll use this. And in case you're wondering, yes, I do indeed back butter even the back of the mesh here because I want to make sure every one of my tiles here is going to be adhered to the thin set. And now I can start peeling off the tape and making sure everything's fine with all my little river rocks here. So you'll see some areas where a little bit of thin set came through and we'll just have to poke those out. I like doing that with uh, Q-tips. And so here we are back again a few minutes later. And it looks like it'll fit. Just kind of mash it down there into the mortar. Good, we'll get one to fit in here. Another one for there. Another one down there and a couple more down here. We'll, we'll cut up some real skinny slivers to fit in there. And you'll never even know it. Well, I can see it's coming along nicely. We put the right wall in here. And now we're getting ready to cement in the left wall. I leave about a quarter of an inch space in front, uh, thickness there, so that we can get our frame piece to fit in there. It's going to be going like this, see? So that's all we got to do. So all of the field tiles of the soap niche are now installed. <clears throat> you can see them all in here. Bottom, left side, right side, and the top. Now I'm going to install my frame made out of the, uh, these are the pencil pieces. These are travertine pencil tiles. So I've already cut them and fitted them together so there won't be any surprises. And all I'm going to do is transfer them from here and fit them right up into here. So let me show you this here. We're gonna go right here and I'll have to do a lot of finagling with spacers and stuff to get everything all the grout lines even so we'll get started on that well there you have it all of the travertine pencil tile pieces are now framed around the outside of the, the niche here so you can see the real tricky part was getting all of the grout lines to even out so that's where we used all of these blue wedges here. But in the end, it was worth it. You're looking at about five hours worth of work right there, just on this niche alone, from the time we started tiling it. All right, so here as we tile up the wall, one thing that I like to do is, you, you see how you get this gap here, right near the end of the, the, the edge of the tile there? I usually like to take my little two inch taping knife and I'll just go along the edge and cram some of the thin set mortar down there and make it nice and flat. Just kind of scrape it like that. Let's see. And you can see I've already done it up the side. So see how it kind of fills it in there nicely. And it's not as critical here because you know you're on a wall, there's no load on it. 
and this is a ceramic tile it's not natural stone <clears throat> but usually I work with a lot of travertine stone and so I do this just kind of out of habit but I always think it's prudent just to make sure you have no gaps <clears throat> that you're covered right up to the edge like that Let's see and on the floor, this would be kind of critical because if you had a gap like that over time, there's a risk that you could crack it. But definitely with travertine and natural stones, it would be a problem because those are very brittle. And the uh, Tile Council of North America handbook that we'll show you in a little bit mentions on here that with natural stone, they want you to do this. They want you to go all the way to the edge with it to protect the edges and the corners. All right, so you can see here we have um, the, you know these accent tiles here, and uh, so we left a space here for them when we were putting these up, um, just because of time constraints in the logistics. We had to make sure we we were moving along on this wall and getting these tiles up. So we put wood blocks here to allow these accent pieces to fit with an eighth inch above and an eighth inch below for the grout lines to separate them from the field tiles. And so we're going to insert some of those in here um, today. All right, so we have this river rock here, okay? And this is, um, these stones are going to be placed up here. You, we cut them earlier. And so what we had to do was we had to stitch them up in order to fit around the tub spout. So you can see they're going to just fit nicely right in here. And these are such a pain to deal with. So you have to blue tape the top side of them. And we'll see if that's enough to keep them rigid enough. So our plan with these is to, with our putty knife, we're going to just skim coat right in here, about an eighth of an inch or so, and then do a skim coat right here in the back of this mesh. And then we're not, we'll hang it on the wall like this. And we're just going to embed it slightly in there and then we're going to take a, a wood block and this wood block here will go across the tiles and it will make sure that these sheets of, of stone here are perfectly flush. We're not going to push them in with our hand and then we'll wait about a half hour or so until it sets up a little bit so we know it's not going to move and we'll gently peel the tape back and make sure the stones are exactly where we want them to be. Because some of these, we had to stitch them in one, one by one to go around here. So I have a little strip that's going here and a little strip that's going there. And we have another sheet over here. The sheet here, with these two strips here, is going to form the circle here that goes around this shower valve here. Once we get these two done, it'll be pretty easy. I have my other sheets already pre-cut on left and right, perfect edges to line up to here. And we'll shoot those all the way up the wall there. Okay, so the batch of thin sets a little bit on the, on the runnier side. So what we're going to do here is normally we would trowel it onto the wall and trowel out our patterns on the on, you know our parallel lines there on the wall. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to do that on the back of the tile and we're going to back butter the wall instead. So normally we back butter the tile and trowel out on the wall, but this time until the, it thickens up a little bit, we're going to back butter the wall instead and trowel out the, the tile here. We're aiming for, you know, pretty close to 100% coverage here. Um, it's in a wet area, and so they want 95% coverage. That's the Tile Council of North America. They want 95% coverage. So uh, we like to use this. this. This is called the back butter butter. It's a very useful, almost like a lazy Susan type thing. And it fits over a standard uh, bucket from Lowe's or Home Depot. And we just put it on there and use it to rotate the tiles around as we're back buttering. It makes it a lot more efficient. All right, so now that I've keyed in the initial, the initial skim coat on the back, I'm adding additional mortar on there. And the additional mortar is what we're gonna to use to actually comb out all parallel lines. And I'm using a half inch trowel here because anytime you have a tile dimension larger than 12 inches, that's considered a large format tile. 
So anytime you have a large format tile greater than 12 inches, it's considered you know large format. So I always like to use the half inch trowel uh, for that. And uh, the Tile Council also recommends that it be the trowel this way, the short distance across a tile. And I'll show you why. So, and at a 45 degree angle, you don't want to go low like that. You want them to be deep. So 45 degrees, see? And then you come back and do the other side. Keep them all in the same direction. Do not do what other fools do and don't swirl it around or anything. Perfectly straight like this. I'm going to come back and fix this in a minute. But I just want to show you the, how the lines are supposed to look. And the reason why they tell you to use the short dimension is because the air has less distance to travel. So the air that's in these valleys here will just shoot out the ends this way. Whereas if I made them lengthwise, it would be harder to manipulate the tile into place. I mean, this thing weighs a lot, and this is only a ceramic tile. When I do half-inch travertine, I forget about it, these things can weigh 20 pounds. So, but anyway, when you have that much um, mortar on the back of one of these things and trying to push it against the wall and get it to mush down can be difficult. So you always want to do things in your favor here. Use the, the proper mechanical advantages to help you get the job done. Yeah, so you can see it's still a little bit rough, so I prefer to just apply it to the wall with a six inch taping knife. Uh, sometimes the trowel, the, the flat edge of the regular trowel can be too much to deal with, yeah, especially when you're going up the wall this high and you're starting to get above your head. And so we just start keying it in until we get uh, all of this covered. So we're going to cover this area right here in between these lines that I've drawn here. Okay, so when you're dealing with this uh, Curdy Rondec uh, corner pieces here, um, there's two different ways to do it. Some people will tile in the entire edge all the way up, and then you can just stick this behind in the mud, behind all of them. And that's fine too, I, I do it both ways. I guess just the way it worked out today, we had cemented it earlier in the lower section and just made sure it was straight. So now we're going to put this in here, and the thing to remember is to keep this clean, but to keep the, the skim coat troweled all the way to the level so that the plastic is completely embedded in it. And there's a white edge along there that when you set the tile in there, will give you a perfect grout joint. So we're gonna set the tile in here and push the tile in and make sure I'm going to go perpendicular to my, remember all my lines are going this way because that's the shorter side of the tile. So I'm going to go perpendicular and then when I'm done and the tile's sort of in place and sticking on the wall, I'm going to make sure we're all the way up against that Curdy Rondack piece so that we're going to have that perfect grout line that continues all the way down. Okay, And then one thing I always do is I always check for level. Okay, so what I, every time I put a tile on the wall here, first thing I always do is, am I flat? Am I going straight up? I want to make sure every single tile when I go up the wall is flat. And so it looks like here, just from, if you look at the bubble there, it looks like it, the bottom end needs to come in just a frog here. So I'm just going to push the bottom end of this tile a little bit and you'll see the Thin sets start to ooze out a little, so you know it was definitely going in. And you retake your measurement, and you're perfect. You're right in the center. Then, what I always do, too, is I get the bigger four-footer out, and I'm making sure that I'm flat all the way up. You can see the bottom tile all the way up to the to this one here, and they're, they're nice and flat, so there's no, no change of plane there. So... This tile is now in, and then one other sanity check I'm going to do here is take the two-foot level and bridge across and see if we're level there. And you can see we're right smack dab in the middle there. This is perfectly level, going right across these two. So to me, it doesn't matter what order I put tiles in. I'm accurate enough that I can feel confident enough that I can put a tile here, 
put a tile 10 feet away over here and when I measure across it's going to be perfect. So prior to putting this tile on, what I'm going to do is put a couple of my tile leveling clips there. And so here you can see my nicely combed ridges are here. Now the thing to remember, when you put the tile in place, you don't want to just mash it down low. You want to make sure first that you can feel a little bit of a resistance and that it's not automatically going to set um, in, in from this other tile that's already there. It's got to be at the same level. So it's best to come at it from outside and push in without it going way down too deep below it. That's how you get lippage. So the idea is to just mash it down until such time that they're level. Then you can do all your, your uh, spirit level activity, make sure the, the things are shimmed up into the proper orientation there. And then we'll, we'll stick our little wedges in here. So the wedges will be kind of going like this. We'll tighten them down in a minute with a tool. And we're going to clean this out in a minute because you don't want an excess of cement building up there on you. I can see this has to come over a bit there. Now I'm going to take my level and put it on top of it and see if we're a level. And we are. So we're pretty good in there. And then I always check the side edge of it as well. And he just needs to come in a little like this on the bottom. And that over there. Then I'm going to check the... And on this one here, it looks like the top needs to go in a bit. And you can tell because I can see there's a little bit of lippage right there. So I know that that top end has to go in a little more. So that's the benefit of not just mashing it all the way in at first. The, the idea is to, similar to the way we wet shimmed, where you just put the board on and individually move things in and out until it is nice and level. So you don't get any, uh, any lippage there. So I'm going to put this other clip in here. And I'm going to take my level, and you can see every time I put a piece in, you're almost spending five minutes per piece just checking level. You know, you shouldn't see any rocking. So this is nice and straight there. That's nice and just, you hear it smack? That's perfectly, perfectly straight up and down, and my bubble is right in the middle there. So this whole wall right here, it's just perfectly straight up and down. There's no curving in or out, and you can tell because at the end of the day, you won't have it square or, or your tiles will start varying away from the wall. And you'll find yourself putting in a ton of thin set just to get the, the thing on. So now that I've got my clips on there, I'm gonna take my tool here and just tighten down these. Uh, actually, these already went in tight enough. I may have to adjust this. There we go. These are going good. And as you tighten this down, what it does is because the, f the flat edge of this wedge here squeezes against both tiles, it forces them both to be at the exact same level with each other. No, there's no lippage at all whatsoever there. Zero. Then after I get all those clipped in, I take my level and I double check everything again. Up and down is good. Horizontal. I can adjust it a teeny bit because you can see what happened when we tightened in this thing. It tends to force it out a little bit. So we have to take our mallet. I just give it a few low taps. And it forces it back into place. Right. So 
So now when I recheck, there we go, we're perfect. We're perfect on that dimension. Let's see how these two go across here. That's good and level there. So now we are ready to move on to the next tiles. Okay, so the way you tell that you did a great job and that there's no lippage is I usually take the flat surface of my wedge. You should be able to go back and forth and it shouldn't snag at all, okay? If you already hit lippage, that's what would happen when you get stuck. See the back end of this, the tail end of this wedge is not even a sixteenth of an inch. So if there was any lippage, and that's less than the sixteenth of an inch, you can see I'm hitting it. But nope, every one of my tiles, I can snake in and out and around and all over. And that's it. Alright, so here we are with the, the stones here that are on the, wire, on the mesh. And I've already put a, a thin skim coat here onto the wall. And you don't want to do too much because it's all going to come oozing through here anyway. So what you, you want to do here is we're just going to back butter this one here a little bit. Just a very thin amount because the combination of this eighth inch or so that I'm putting on the back of here with about an eighth inch on the wall there is going to equal almost a, a quarter of an inch. So this way here, we're assuring that we're going to get some pretty good coverage here. Now I'm hoping that since we put the blue tape on the front side that it will keep these things here intact and that it won't slide down the wall or kind of fold on itself. Sometimes the blue tape isn't really effective enough, it's not stiff enough. So we'll have to see what it does here. And if that's the case, then we'll end up having to put this onto some curdy uh, membrane first and then putting curdy membrane on to the wall. Sort of an intermediary step, but I'm hoping this is going pretty, pretty good. So I'm just kind of making sure I got a nice even amount here. I'm trying not to put too much in there. Just enough to make us 100% contact. And by the way, when you're back buttering tiles, don't be fooled into, the, into the thinking, oh, I've got 100% coverage just because you back buttered the whole back of your tile. You don't get 100% coverage unless you have 100% coverage, unless all, everything here is touching everything there. That's the way the coverage works. So when you comb down your big tiles and you, you've got those trowel lines, those, those parallel trowel lines, if those lines don't collapse down, you're not going to get any contact. The only part that will be contacting is just the, the top part of those lines. Yeah. Alright, so I've got what I think is a good workable amount here on here. Let me just add a little bit more to these guys. And then you can see what I've done down here at the bottom. The curdy panel board actually ends right there. So there's about a half inch gap or so. So what I've done is I've actually filled that in with thin set mortar just to make sure that the rocks at the bottom have some kind of support behind them because kids are going to be throwing toys and who knows what's going to be happening in this bathtub later on and you want to have support behind this you don't want any loose part of the tiles hanging down and that's why you really can't see it from the camera angle but there's a little bit of a gap right there that I'm going to fill in right now which is on the big tile just to make sure that that big tile has adequate coverage behind it so I'm going to put them in there and fill in that gap. And now we're ready to try our luck in this piece. Just very gently lift it, let it hang. You don't want to bend it, twist it or anything, just let it hang. And push it into the mortar. So far it's holding. So what we want to do then is use our wood board here. Just 
push them in. And now he's nice and flat in there. And so what we're going to do is, once this sets up, we'll give it about a half hour or so to just to kind of firm up a little more. And then we'll come in and we'll peel off the tape. Let me just see if I can gently even pull a little of the tape off. Now, yeah, see, well, it'll, it'll tend to pull some of these rocks with it. See, so you have to wait a little while. So once that happens, um, I don't feel comfortable leaving the tape on overnight like, like some people do because you don't know what happened to the rocks in there and you don't want to come in tomorrow and find out that one is sticking out at an angle at you. So you want to wait till it sets up, peel the tape off, find the ones that need to be adjusted and go ahead and adjust them. All right, so now, uh, now that we're done with the installation of all the tiles, um, this is natural stone here, these rocks, and so are these pencil pieces here. So what we're going to do is we're going to put on a sealer and enhancer. Now there's two types of this sealer that you can get. There's one like this one that has the enhancer built into it, and then there's another type that doesn't have an enhancement. So this sealer will kind of add like a little bit of contrast to it. And um, if you don't want that type of effect to it, then you can just get the regular sealer and it will leave it looking exactly like this. It'll, it'll kind of blend. I like to give it a little punch, a little kick to it. So I've already got some here in a cup here. And all I do is very simple. Use my paintbrush here. I just brush it across. Try to let it get in the middle there too, on the sides, the edges of the stone. What this sealer does, because this is natural stone, it's very porous. And when you go to grout, if you, if you were to just grout right on these, you could possibly stain these and this might even absorb the grout and you wouldn't be able to get all of it like off the front and uh, sometimes it seeps into the edges and, and it discolors your natural stone. So this just keeps it looking like natural stone without it being absorbing. And um, you can see right now it's getting a little bit contrasty. So you can see how these here on the right hand side have a little bit more saturation to the color, a little more contrast to it. So that's what that effect does. And then um, down here on the pencil, I don't want to get any on the other tiles because those are ceramic, they don't need to get sealed. But you just kind of drag it all gently across. And you can, you, can, you can see almost right away how the effect of the the enhancing part, see how the these grain patterns here are really starting to become prominent. And that's all you do, and you gotta wait two days, two to three days before you can grow. That's uh, working with stone takes a long time because it adds a lot of days to your calendar for all of the extra steps and stuff that you have to do. But you do have to do it. If you try to take a shortcut, you're gonna end up with a failed installation. All right, so now I'm going to seal this travertine sill that we installed also. Now, this is pretty shiny up top, so it's pretty well honed, but I don't know if it's still porous or not, so I am going to go ahead and seal it. I know the front feels kind of rough, so he's definitely going to get it on the front here. So just brush it right on, and you leave it on for about a half hour, and then you, if there's any excess there, you just wipe it off. Yeah, you know, I can see it enhancing it a little bit, so I'm willing to bet that this is still porous underneath that pretty smooth and shiny honing that they did. I'm just going to grab the front of it here. Now watch, you can see how quickly uh, the enhancement process works. Let's see if it brings up any of the grain on the front here like it did on the, the rocks. So this process you have to do um, every three years according to the manufacturer of this product. Some sealers, if you buy the really cheap ones, are maybe good for a year or so. And that's it. That's all you got to do. Just got to wait a couple of days before we can grout. I just wanted to share with you this uh, 
little trick here. Um, whenever you get like little bits of globs of, you know, thin scent mortar that poke through the mesh and come too far forward, I usually like to use a nail set because it's got a nice sharp pointed edge. And I just get in there and kind of clean it out, kind of like a dentist doing, cleaning up the cavities there. <clears throat> so this is very useful for getting some of those little chunks out. And then when you're done, before you seal up the rocks, you get a, uh, a vacuum cleaner and suck out all of this dust. And come by with a, <clears throat> right here, I'm going to get a wet rag and bring it over here and get this little bit of cement off the front. So that's all you got to do, just scrub down your rocks really good. All right, so we're going to be using this Navajo brown colored grout. And I never mix water, uh, use water to mix the grout. I always use like a, a grout additive and a sealer. So this one here is made by the manufacturer to go with the grout. And I've already dumped 32 ounces of it in here. We're only going to mix half a batch. So this is a 25 pound bag. I'm only going to put in 12 and a half pounds of product. All right, so we have our grout ready to go. I've got my float. I usually use the small float on the wall because usually what we do is we're only grouting along the lines here, right? So we're going to be going kind of like this. And there's no reason to put grout all over the rest of the tile, like, you know, on the floor. Sometimes people will just dump it out. On big tiles like this, I don't. I prefer to just work a little bit of it along the line so you don't have haze to clean up all over the place. It just makes clean up a lot better. And in case it doesn't work well for us, which sometimes sanded grout is a real pain to get up the wall and to get it to go like this and stay without flaking and falling all over the place. We have this board down here, which will capture all of it and we'll scoop it up and put it back in the bucket. And in case this doesn't work, I may have to go old school on it here and put on the old rubber grouting gloves and sometimes I find it easier to just do the backsplash with the grouting gloves on and just mash it in there and smooth it around with my hands and I can feel better where the grout is going in. So let's give it a try. So you can see it's doing okay for us right now but you can bet as the mix dries it'll start to get a little harder to maintain this. But that, that's what we do. You just try to go in at a 45 degree angle. Sometimes I'll come straight down at first, right? And uh, like this. And then what happens is once you want to get it off, you want to get all the excess off by scraping it at a real steep angle. See how it brings almost all of it off? That way you're not going to have to be sponging as much of the product off of there. So here you can see I've switched to the glove to get at some of these tighter spots. I think it's just a little bit more uh, efficient use of the time. Plus I can get into the, some of the nooks and crannies, like I gotta get up in there with it, okay. Okay, so here I can, I can get a good feel for what's going on here with the stones. And I get all of these areas filled in because I can feel it better with my hand. All right, so it's been about almost 15 minutes on this part up here. So I'm gonna take my sponge right here. And I always use a nice tall bucket of clean water. And when it starts to get cloudy, you wanna make sure you change that to fresh, clear water because you don't wanna keep putting muddy water back onto the wall. That would defeat your purpose of cleaning it off. You got your sponge here, right? And what I always do is one stroke only, then flip it over one stroke. Flip it on this edge, flip it on this edge here, and then that edge, and that edge. So there's six edges to this sponge. So you only get six wipes, and then you have to go back and redunk it. Do not wipe it, and then come back on to another part of the tile with the same side that you just wiped, because all you're going to be doing is smearing mud around. So this is what I do. I come right down the, the line there, and I flip it over. I come right down here and flip it over. And I come right down the edge, like that. Flip it over to the other edge, come right down this edge, and so forth. So you can see this is already kind of drying and getting a little hard, so I'm gonna probably do two applications of this. And then a couple of hours later, I may come by with a damp cloth and just clean off the main part of the tile and leave the grout alone. I won't touch the grout. 
And then when the grout dries overnight, it should be just a very thin powdery haze that should wipe off with a dry cloth. And we're progressing along here, and I usually just do small sections at a time. Um, another trick I like to do too here is I'll wet the tiles down a little bit first. That'll make it less likely for the grout to um, stick and leave a lot of haze, but it also moistens the area right near the grout lines. So as the grout gets, um, sorry, as the grout gets a little bit drier, and I'm reaching down here and I'm gonna put some in here. It helps moisten it a little as I go to put it into the into the channels there. See that? And it makes it easier to wipe this off too with the sponge. Well, we've completed the initial grouting and uh, wiping phase. It's been about four or five hours so far. And you can see there's a little bit of haze on the, on the rocks there. And we have, uh, you can see some little bit excess haze right here in some of these areas. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I have a fresh new bucket of water here with a sponge. And I'm just going to hit the areas of the tile away from the, the grout lines. Uh, I'm going to probably get a little bit of water dribbling on it, but it's not really going to do anything. I'm not uh, brushing up against it and dragging, you know, more grout off or you know, making more mud or anything out of it. I'm just only going to clean the surface of the tile. So, for example, you can see here, I'm going to do just this one right here. and just going to do a wipe right there all the way down to in that stop before the grout line. And you can see not a whole lot comes off, which is good because at this point there shouldn't be a lot of haze on there. And if I go to the other side of the sponge now and do it again, see virtually nothing. So each successive time you wipe now, you should have less and less haze on there that would cause any problem for you. And then when you squeeze it into the, into the water, you'll see your water will stay clearer longer so we're going to continue this all around. Well, you can see how much of a difference it made by sponging it off. If you see the right side here looks nice and clean, whereas the left side and the rocks here still have the haze on it. So now that we're pretty much done with the, the larger tiles, we're now going to do it just a quick light sponge down here on the rocks because we need to bring the color back on these is way too much haze on haze that I don't think it'll come off very easily in the morning. So you can see I just have the the uh, sponges just barely damp and just trying to scrape off some of the the haze there without disturbing the grout and you can see it's not really affecting the sponge too much there but I'll go to the other side here see up here at the top just to try to get the, the haze off of the, the rocks and then here in the niche you can see there's a little bit of haze right along the bottom piece here so I just want to give that a good wipe get that cleaned off and then I'll go ahead and just give these a quick wipe to bring back the color. So now when we come in in the morning, the haze will be truly a nice, clean, thin, powdery layer that all we gotta do is just wipe it off with a dry cloth. Well, here we are the next morning. The grout has dried and you can see that uh, there really isn't much noticeable haze on the, the field tiles here. In fact, if I take my dry cloth here and just rub it just to see what's on there, um, really don't see anything coming off on there. So this idea of washing the tiles uh, last night really paid off handsomely for us. Hardly any work to do. The only place that we really need to focus on is here on the, um, the, the river rocks here. Because as you can see, there's still some uh, little bit of streaks of grout on there because you just can't keep washing it and washing it while it's still wet. You're just going to spread more mud around. So what I usually do is I come by the next morning with my dry terry cloth towel or microfiber. Works pretty good too. And it will dig in and kind of clean up the... See how it 
cleans uh, most of it off. And likewise, you find others on here too. And we're just gonna go up and down the whole wall here. So here's one that looks like it's almost completely immersed. And we'll just give it a little scrub. And I got some of it up, but uh, we'll, we'll come by later with a, with a wet microfiber cloth that'll help cut through the rest of that. And here's another one here. You can see just a little bit of haze here on my hexagon, so I'm just gonna give them a quick wipe with a wet rag. So it brings out their original color here very nicely. Well, we can see now the tub glazing guys have come in and they did an excellent job as usual, glazing up the tub here. What they have to do is they come in and they sand it down buff it up nice and rough, they spray a primer on, and then after that they come in and spray a couple of coats of the, the final glazing. I don't like to use those kits in the big box stores because they, they really don't work well. You really need professional grade quality products and the uh, machines that they use to apply them with. Uh, the whole process takes them about an hour and a half, and you can see they tape up around it. They usually cover the the toilet, they'll put a cloth over the sink and cover the lights. You have to turn off the air conditioner so it's not circulating anything. And it's best if you have a window like we do and a lot of the, uh, the overspray kind of goes right out the window there. So once they're done, you have to wait 48 hours. Uh, we've waited three days now. They did it on Friday. It's Monday now. And then we can um, start to go and come in and put in the hardware. And I try to be very careful from this point on in. I don't get in there with my shoes on I'm always in there with my socks on if I even need to get in there at all and I you know I would try to avoid it and we're gonna have to do some work a um, little bit more work up here later uh, putting some more caulking in and stuff and so we'll make sure that we're in our socks when we do that now there's one very important thing that you want to keep in mind now when it comes time to remove all this tape here you gotta come by with a utility knife and just make sure you score it first. Otherwise, who knows what it could do. It could start to peel some of that uh, enamel off. Or, so you just wanna make sure you're really careful. You come by and score everything first with a knife and then you can peel the film off. Well, this is the final step here where we're going to caulk all of our corners and such. Um, what I like to do here, whenever I'm caulking, and especially in the bathrooms, I always like to use the blue tape here so that I can get absolutely perfect straight edges here. And, and I know exactly where to put the caulk, just right there in the corners there. You don't put too much, um, th because you want this tape here to give you perfectly straight edges. And if you just glob too much into these corners, when you peel the tape up, you're going to be left with ridges on the, on the caulk there. So you just want to put enough just to make sure that it's down and straight and then you immediately pull up the tape. Don't wait even two or three minutes. So you do one section at a time and pull the tape up and get it out of there. And uh, we'll just go up through all of this whole area here. I've got it on the window sill, the window frames. We're going to go along the bottom there as well. And it's very simple. This way here it's foolproof. And there may be people out there who think they can do a better job than this, but nobody's finger can give a perfectly straight line. And so that's what we're going to do. It takes a lot longer to do this, probably about an hour to tape all of this up, and most people aren't willing to go through all of that extra effort. But it will pay off in the end, you'll see when you're done. Because all you had to do is just very quickly come by in here, and you don't have to worry about you miss a spot or you got too much in a spot because it'll just come out nice for you. All right, so I'm just gonna show you how I uh, start in the corner over here. I try to go all the way across whatever section I'm doing. And I'm just laying a thin bead, Not you don't want a whole lot. This area here might need a little bit more coverage here. But you just wanted to cover that basic area there. And we'll get a little more. And just take your thumb and tool it in. Try not to make it overly thick. 
And as soon as I finish the downside and the backside here, I'll immediately peel the tape off so that we don't let it dry because it'll start curing pretty quickly on you. So here you can see how nice and straight the caulk line was going all the way up the corner. In fact, it just looks like a regular grout line. So the manufacturer here does a really good job matching their sanded grouts to their sanded caulk. And here you can see along the bottom of the where the tile meets the tub how it's just nice and perfectly straight.